All right, so we left off finishing with the covenant of works over the last few weeks. The covenant of works has been broken. Adam fell in sin. But uh, the kind of thing we have to kind of keep in, in, our, in the back of our mind is that the covenant of redemption made before the foundation of the world, which we'll look in at detail as we get closer to talking about the, co- the new covenant made in, with the new covenant with Christ, the covenant of redemption is there. Um, that means that despite mankind being dead in sin, despite mankind being exiled from the garden, despite mankind being exiled from the tree of life, despite mankind being exiled from any access to God, God has already made provision for the need that is there. God has already planned out this entire, the entirety of this plan. God is not caught off guard by Adam's sin. God is not caught off guard by the fall of mankind. God has already made a plan, the covenant of redemption, to make provision for the people to be reconciled to himself and be saved. Now, that will work itself out in time and place in the covenant, in the covenant of grace, in the new covenant. But um, the plan has already been made before time began that God would save a people from their sins that Christ would come and, and be born of a virgin and take on flesh and die in the place of sinners on a cross and be raised from the dead and fulfill all righteousness and will save his people from their sins, right? And so you, you kind of have to have that, and we have to kind of have that in our, the backdrop of our minds as we're think, working through all this. Adam fell. So you kind of need to feel the weight of like, oh man, the, the hopelessness of that, because we don't really know at this point, I mean, mankind does not know at this point that God has made this plan, but he has, right? We get to be on this side of it and we go, oh man, look, look at what God has planned out. But, um, when you're kind of go, when they're going through this, you don't know, there's just, there's just hopelessness because Adam has fallen in sin, but plan in the covenant of redemption promised in Genesis 315, which we saw a little bit last week, even in the fall and the curses, we have this promise of some sort of redemption to come in, in the offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent and reconcile mankind. So we have that kind of promise given in Genesis 3.15, and we'll see it play itself out in the new covenant, but um, planned in the covenant of redemption. Um, so it, when we talk about all that, any questions from last week? Any questions about what I just said right there? That's kind of the setup for this as we move into the Noahic covenant. All right. Well, then turn your Bibles to Genesis 8. So the covenant of works that we talked about the last few weeks has all of creation in view. Right? No part of creation is untouched by that covenant. It's my contention, and I think the, the contention of Christian theology, that the, the Noahic covenant, the covenant made with Noah, also falls under that same category. It touches all of humanity, <clears throat> all of creation. God, if you want to so, say, you know, we kind of divided the covenants up into, into the different kingdoms of which they, they affect, the kingdom of creation, all people, the covenant of works, the covenant of Noah. So no, the effects of, the, of uh, the covenant made with Noah go all the way across all humanity, all creation. As man multiplied, we're moving from Genesis 3. Mankind is kicked out of the garden. They move forward. Someone tell me what happened between Genesis 3 and Genesis 8. Worse and worse. Yeah. Sin, uh, sin has this kind of effect where it doesn't just stay ecstatic. It compounds, it snowballs. And so as generation to generation passed, mankind got worse and worse. Uh, what was the hope of mankind at that point? You know, in, in, in kind of one sense, there was no hope. <clears throat> in another sense, the only hope was that little seed of promise that was given back at Genesis 3.15. But yet, as of yet, there had seen no fruition of it. Now, <clears throat> I think we talked about this very briefly last week. Did Adam and Eve 
believe that promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15? I think every evidence is they did. Every, the, that they believed that promise. In fact, it was kind of, the, it's the, that promise and it passed, being passed down through generations, being, being given by the one the promise was given to, repeated to their offspring, was, is kind of the theme throughout the book of Genesis, right? And God's preservation of that promised seed, that promised offspring that would crush the head of the serpent. All those things were passed down. And so I, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that they believe that. But we end up in Genesis 8. Mankind has gotten worse and worse. God has permitted the sinfulness of man to increase to the extent that everyone on the planet was as, as seemingly as sinful as could, they could get. Right? It appeared to, to human eyes that those who served the Lord and believed in His promises would all be destroyed. That there would be no hope for any kind of offspring because all people were sinning. And yet, God preserves His promise. Now, look with me at, at Genesis 8. Now, Moses, as he's composing this account of Noah, what, what do you think... Uh, all right, how do I want to phrase this? What, what do you think the, the reference, like the imagery of Genesis 8 is coming from? Now, in Genesis 8, you have the, the flood subsiding. And then starting in verse 20, you have the covenant that God makes with Noah. Someone want to read Genesis 8 for us? Who has a nice, good voice that will read Genesis 8 for us? Yeah, you good? So God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with them in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. He went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from waters had subsided from the face of the ground, but the dove found no place to sit, set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and then again sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and the bowl in her mouth was a freshly <coughs> That's good. <clears throat> All right. So what do we hear in that language that reminds us of something else? It's a recreation. Right? It is very similar to the language of Genesis 1. Right? You have the wind. You have the great deep. You have dry land emerging from the water. Right? This is all from Genesis 1. You have birds again filling the heavens and man and animals filling the earth. Noah, like Adam, received a commission that we see here in, in the next part to be fruitful and fill the earth. All right, so in verse 20, 
Verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord. It took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah, going into chapter 9, and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right? It's the same command that was given to Adam. And so all of this is to tell us that the, flood, that the, the kind of end of the flood story is a recreation of God's earth. But it's not a complete resetting of the system, right? It's not, it's not starting over. It's just a cleansing and a recreation. Man does not return back to paradise. Man does not return back to sinless state. Right? All things are not reset completely. It's just a kind of a cleaning out of the old and God restarting with people on, on earth. But those people are not sinless. They're not in the garden. They are still sinful. Um, and so in the flood narrative, uh, in Genesis eight twenty one, we see that the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. The flood event saved the lives of Noah and his family, but it didn't save their souls. And there's a lot of things that are still... There's needs here that are left unmet. The flood saved, the, saved their lives. It pre- preserved eight people out of all the mass of humanity, but it didn't change their heart. Right? And the new creation that Noah has in his family, they enter into a world that still has sin in it. And so the face of the earth must may be f- less full of wickedness, but the heart of man is still as wicked as ever. I think that's an important thing, an important distinction for us to remember of... This is a recreation, but it's not, it's not the same thing as sinless creation. Right? They're not entering into Eden. They're not entering into paradise. They're not entering into that place of God's presence. They're just in a fallen world with less sinful people. And I don't mean less sinful in quality, less sinful in quantity. And so um, the fact that, that the entire kind of picture of the the earth drying out. I mean, I think there's some, I think there's a lot of interesting things in just the, when it happens, this, the first day of the, on the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried off from the earth. There's, there's a whole, whole lot going on here. Uh, but not only is the, the flood narrative presented as kind of a echo of, eat, of recreation, the commands that are given are very similar. So chapter 9, verse 1, we just read that. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But look at verse 2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. In Genesis 1, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. And there you had kind of a, uh, that commission was rather positive, right? Positive significance, the idea of building and mastery, usefulness. This commission, though, brings with it the idea that man will achieve mastery over the animal kingdom by fear and force. So it's a slightly different charge, isn't it? You know, before Adam is naming the animals and there seems to be some sort of um, relationship with animals that, that, his mastery over them is not difficult. It's not striving with them. It is an easy rule. This is not the case, right? The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heaven, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. But yet they're going to be delivered into your hand. And so you see it's the same but different. The same kind of language occurs, by the way, um, this idea when Israel is going into Canaan. Did you ever notice that? When Israel is going into Canaan, think of like uh, Deuteronomy 8. Uh, not Deuteronomy 2. Deuteronomy 2, when the people are entering the land, God basically tells the people, uh, you're going to go into the land and the fear of you, the dread of you is going to be on every man. They're, they are, you're going to go in, they're going to be delivered to you, but they're going to be fearful, they're going to fight against you. Your, your um, reign over them will not be recognized by them. 
you, you have, you will be given rain, but they won't recognize it, and they're going to fight back. The fear and dread came upon all the Canaanite nations. And so, <clears throat> in the midst of that, I think you have, you, you see how these, the pictures are kind of building on itself as we move through the Old Testament. So now you have the picture of, of Noah and his family being given this commission. All right, here's a, a freshly washed earth, and you are now to go and take dominion. But listen, the animals who you just lived with on the ark, they're not going to listen to you. They are going to be scared of you. They're going to run from you. They're going to attack you. And so your relationship with them is not the same. <clears throat> and then he, God builds on that and goes, the same kind of commission to the Israelites. You're going to go in and the fear and dread of you is on there. But in both situations, you're called to go in and build a civilization. You're called to go in and build. Start from scratch. Take advantage in the best sense of the word of the natural world. Lay hold of it and use its resources to build civilization. And that's basically what Noah's called to do. Just like it's what Israel is called to do when they're going to Canaan. And so this is what we would call a cultural mandate of sorts. It's part of a covenant ruling a kingdom. And it applies to who? The people got the, Noah and his family. But by extension, who? All humanity. All humanity. Right? Because this is part of the kingdom of creation. There, there's, there's no special tie here to just those who believe. This is all humanity. This is the responsibility of humanity. Use the resources that God has given well, but use them. And use them to build something. And so, are we accountable to this covenant? People are looking, some, some people are shaking their head, but not like, not, not assertively, just kind of like, I think that's right. <laughs> yes. Does this inform how we live our lives now? Yes, it does. Is it good for us to utilize the resources that are around us? Yes. I think written in that is that we need to be good stewards of what God's given also, right? So you, we're not, we're not wasteful. We're not, we're not, uh, we don't want to be dismissive of, of uh, being a good steward of the resources, recognizing that some, some resources are finite or limited, right? And so we have to be, we, that's part of being a good steward. We don't, you don't go in and just, you know, use up supplies and then throw it away. You, we use God's creation wisely and well, and we build things. But that means we don't also run away from the use of, of the things that God's provided, we, use, we utilize them to do what we're called to do. And this is a responsibility for all humanity. Equally, everyone must take seriously this covenant. God rules his kingdom through covenant. And we belong to the kingdom of creation, and we're accountable to this covenant, the one that was given in creation and the one that was reiterated in, to Noah. So we're part of a mankind with whom God made this covenant. And this commission applies to mankind today just as it did to Noah and his family. And so, <clears throat> in that sense, this covenant has been passed down to us. And so all mankind is responsible to raise up, establish structure and successful societies, pursue cultural achievement, to grow. Man is not called to just sit in the dirt and mope and wait for the promises of God. Right? Because you could say, oh, well, Genesis 3.15 is coming. We'll just sit here and do nothing, play in the mud. No, like build until God gets here. And so that's part of the Noahic covenant. We're called to work. And though the ground may put forth spurs and thorns and the, we have to work by the sweat of our brow, we're called to work. So despite the pushback from the animals, we're called to rule. Despite the pushback from the earth, we're called to till the earth and work it. Despite the pushback on the painfulness in childbirth, we're called to be fruitful and multiply. And so you see how the, the curse, now, now you're bringing back in the curses of Genesis 3, how they affect the very responsibilities that are given to humanity in creation to, do, to carry out. So the, prompt, the, the curses for, man, the, it's gonna, your work is going to be hard. The ground is not going to easily give up its produce. You're going to have to work it hard. By the way, the childbirth, that's not going to be easy either. That's going to be hard. 
And so the effects of sin affect the way that both men and women, that all of mankind, carry out the responsibilities that God has given to, to them. But we're called to be workers. We're called to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and master it. But even then, this task is slightly different than Adam's task, right? Slightly different. Adam and Eve were called to really extend Eden, to make it a temple. Is that what God's calling his people to do here? To extend the earth and make it a temple? That's a question. To make it a temple? I wonder if I do that, is it more clear that's a question? Right. So, if Adam and Eve, still in the state of sinlessness, if they were to press forward in extending the garden, building and being fruitful and multiply, right? They, let's say Adam had never fallen in sin. They're fulfilling the, the covenant that God has made with them. And the garden is being extended. Mankind is being extended. Their righteous offspring would, would just be kind of building a larger, more consummated paradise where all creation harmoniously serves God, enjoys his blessing and presence. Is that what happens when the Noahic covenant is carried out? As we're building civilizations, are we actually extending God's presence in that same way? No, we're not making the world a temple. And our children are by no means filling the earth with a holy offspring. So even as we're, fulfill, we're faithful to this command, being fruitful and multiplying, building culture, we're not progressing or promoting a holy land or a holy culture or a holy family by Noahic standards, right? By, by, just by physical offspring. Noah's covenant, therefore, is not a covenant of salvation. There is no promise for eternal life tied to the covenant made with Noah. Right? The success or failure of Noah and mankind in obedience to these commands will neither bring them eternal life nor will it bring upon them eternal death. Right? So the failure to do so doesn't bring eternal death. Where does, where does eternal death come from? From the government of works. This is governing how we now live in a world that's fallen. And so when people don't, break, don't build civilization well, when they don't work well, they don't suffer eternal death. They suffer temporal death and poverty. And so if you do it really well, Guess what? You also don't get eternal life. Right? Rome built a majestic civilization. Greece built a majestic civilization. There's no eternal life promise for building that. And so, we have to be clear on that. The promise given here is not the same as the promise given here. The curses given here are not the same as the curses given here. That they governs the same kind of global thing. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? All right. Now we're going to look even further into what is promised in the covenant. And we're going to see what all is required of man. So God establishes and governs his kingdoms through covenant. In the Noahic covenant, God renews the culture building mandate to Noah and mankind. And God also lays down laws about justice, right? And so this is important for us to remember that the Noahic covenant is kind of, un, is part of the underpinnings for which God brings about the promise of salvation and the new commission of, of his people to expand. Right, so all the promises of the kingdom are kind of built on top of the substructure of the, of the Noahic covenant. Does that make sense? I don't know. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, mankind kind of reached the height of evil that threatened the extinction of the Holy Line, but, but God preserved his people. God preserved the promise, and he did it even through the Noahic Covenant. It's preserving his bigger plan of redemption through this plan here that offers no eternal life, but yet in it, the covenant of redemption, the new covenant is preserved. Does that make sense? All right. By the way, I think that's how these covenants work as well. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about that as we get into that in the coming weeks. Look with me at verse 5. Genesis chapter 9. Verse 
we skipped over verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4 basically are tied into verse 2. Right? So the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. That's verse 2. And upon every bird of the heaven, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea, and your hands are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. Let's, and all the carnivores say amen. Right? Like this is, is it okay for us to eat meat? It's part of the Noahic covenant. Like we're told to. And so, unless you physically can't handle that, you're eating, eat some meat. Enjoy it. We live here, there's brisket. I don't know if you guys have had that before. It's good. Right? Right? Um, as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Um, that, that's, I think that's a command for like a side salad. Maybe. I'm not sure. A baked potato. A baked potato. Yeah, that's where you go. But you shall not eat the flesh with its life that, its blood, that is its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. Now, there's a lot we can say about verse 4, but we're not going to talk about that today. It's really uh, inconsequential to our larger discussion. By the way, um, a, a steak, you, you guys know that when you eat like a rare steak, that the juice that comes out is not blood, right? Just making sure. Some people are like, I can't, it's unholy to eat. I'm, a, I'm only going to murder this steak after it's already been killed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy this perfectly good steak by cooking it well done. Shame on you. First of all, shame on you. I, I, can't, I don't have a, bu- a verse to back that up. That's just me. That's just my own. Shame on you. Eat it medium rare at best. Rare. The, the juice that comes out, not blood, not violating this command. Okay, just be clear on that. <clears throat> and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. Here's where it's getting to. Right? Don't eat the flesh with its life, that's its blood, right? Because there's something about blood, there's something about the taking of life that's important here. Verse 5 tells us what it is. For your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you... Be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, and multiply it. And God repeats that earlier command that he gives in verse 1 of chapter 9. In verse 7, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, and multiply it. All mankind is governed by the covenant made with Noah, correct? We've already established that. Is all mankind responsible to carry out this command? Yes. So we think about, how do we think about the death penalty? There's a reason why that's not just a, a, that's not just, that's not an American law, right? We understand it's a universal law. Virtually every society on the planet up until the last 20 years or so had death penalty on the books for this very reason. Some of them don't even, they can't go, oh, they're not quoting Genesis 9, but they know if you take a man's life, your life should be required of you. Why? How do we show that life is valuable? You don't allow the taking of it to go on without severe consequences. Now, I don't want to spend a ton, a ton of time giving caveats about, oh, well, justice systems have to be good. Those are, of course. But the principle of having a death penalty, that's not, that's not an American idea. That is a Noahic covenant command. So as you're thinking through when people make statements about, you know, you know, if we're going to be pro-life, we have to be pro-whole of life. Okay, but don't go so far as to undermine what God's word clearly says about this. And usually when they say we have to be pro-whole of life, what they mean is we're going to undermine this. And we're going to undermine, and you have to also buy into all of our social agenda for, for all these other things too. So everything in between death and life, you have to buy into our political, our political agenda for how that's to be managed to. Now, I reject all of that. To be pro-life, I think, means to be pro-death penalty. Also. Is that bad to say? I don't think it is. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by, by man shall his blood be shed. Now, of course, that means that we need to be certain of what's happening. Like, I don't think you just willy-nilly just be like, oh, this guy's been accused, just wipe them out. There needs to be some certainty there, but the, the principle is laid out plain. 
Death penalty is a universal principle in this sense. Murder directly opposes and prevents the fulfillment of the commission of verse 7. You can't be fruitful and multiply in a society where people are constantly being murdered. Right? So one command is tied to the other command. Be fruitful and multiply. And then God says, okay, now you have dominion over all the animals. And they're going to they're gonna put up a fight, but you're allowed to eat them. That, that bloodshed is okay for, for, your, for your good. But if man sheds the blood of another man, if, man, if a, person sheds, a human sheds the blood of another human, well, then now there's consequences. Your blood will be required. You shed the blood of another human. Your blood will be required. For God made man in his own image. Where is he tying, where's he pulling that from? Back to Genesis 1. Isn't it interesting that, by the way, all the things that are now being disputed as this is just some sort of cultural position in Scripture are always rooted in creation? Your view of gender and sexuality, that's just a cultural invention. God Man, male and female, I created them. Why, why is this good? For God made man his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply. And if you're murdering each other, you can't be fruitful and multiply. And so, murder directly opposes the fulfillment of the command. So to control mankind's sinful nature, to prevent extreme bloodshed, those who murder are subject to death. Right? And we also understand that the, the idea here is murder, not just accidental killing or whatever else, self-defense, justified sorts of things. Um, you know, the, we're talking about murder. So this is the establishment of a legal and judicial retribution in society. Mankind has this power derived from God himself through the covenant in his kingdom to punish those who harm society. In this case, specifically, harm it by murder. And so the death penalty justly deserved and prescribed is an act of God's judgment on the murder and really an act of mercy to the rest of society. Talk about love of neighbor. It is love of neighbor to punish those who murder. It's a good thing. So in the Noahic Covenant, human societies therefore have two basic and related jobs. It seems to me in these first nine verses, right? What are they? To preserve life and to preserve the family. Mankind is to be fruitful and multiply. In society, man looking out for man should promote human fruitfulness and multiplication. And so, by conclusion, any society or government that corrupts the family or murders the innocent is a government in direct treason and disobedience to God through this covenant. Is that, a, is that a fair conclusion? Am I drawing an unfair conclusion on this? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But So is it wrong for us, not just as Christians, but as a society, to demand accountability for our government or our societies who undermine these things? Undermine human fruitfulness and multiplication, undermine families, undermine safety of society from murder? Is it right for us to demand accountability in, of governments? Yes. On what basis? On the Noahic Covenant. Does that go all the way to rebellion? Um, that's a great question. We were actually having that discussion last night. <laughs> we were having that discussion last night. Um, uh, I think in some cases, probably yes. But how quickly is rebellion, and this is, I mean, this is such, such a hard thing to figure out. How quickly does rebellion, it, it, when do I know that my rebellion is not just me trying to get revenge? And now we're into a much harder issue, right? Because I can, I mean, I, so I told the story last night that, that there's a, there was a man that was arrested in Texas. He cut off 37 man buns. He'd gone around behind guys and cut off man buns. And when, and when he was arrested, he said, I'm doing the Lord's work. And I'm like, ah, he, I, I, I want to hear this argument. Like, I, <laughs> like I'm kind of I'm curious as to where he's going with this, right? Like, 
Now, I don't know what his justification for that is. I don't think he could point to a biblical justification that he's literally doing the Lord's work. I'm not saying what he's doing isn't good. But, um, so, that's a silly illustration to go, like, just because we claim we're doing the Lord's work doesn't mean we're actually doing the Lord's work. Um, there's a lot of times where our own frustration, our own um, whatever else would lead us to sin. Even if, even if we're doing the right thing, maybe even our attitudes are, are wrong in doing it. And so you could justify, oh, well, I'm doing what's good for society. But our society also has laws and ways to, to do things well. Right? And I think that's part of a good society also is that you have a good legal structure to where things can be, where things don't always go to, this is wrong, I'm going to kill you to make sure you know that's wrong. Because right? then I think that then we're back to violating this command. And so there's, there, I think there's, there's, there's many steps before rebellion has to be the step. There's many legal steps, many uh, rational steps before you get to rebellion. It doesn't mean that rebellion's off the table. It just means that there's a lot of steps that you have to follow to make sure you're abiding by. A, a, if you're going to build a just society, the idea is you build it with just laws. And so, um, at the end of the day, you have the American Revolution, right? That, that at some point, that was necessary. Yeah. So yeah. So Christians have may have different response. Individual Christians. Yeah, because that's oftentimes again another thing we talked about last night. Um, one of the things that uh, that oftentimes happens is people say, "Oh, the church needs to be doing this," and you go, "What do you mean by that? Like the institution or the people?" Because almost always when people say the church needs to be doing this, what we mean is the people, and I'm 100 percent in agreement. Like, yes, we need Christians in every area of society building good society, building a good society. We want Christians running hospitals and banks. We want Christians who are, we want good Christians who are lawyers, good Christians who are janitors. We want good Christians picking up our trash. We want good Christians, right? We want, we want a society that looks like that, where, where the kingdom of God is spreading out such that the people are transformed by the gospel and living lives that are building up the kingdom of God first and foremost, but also a society that upholds that. I don't think that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. And so... Um, I think there's hints of this in the Noahic Covenant, right? To build a society, wh what are you building it on? You're building it on laws. Well, where do those laws come from? Just, or is it just pure democracy? We just get to vote on the laws? No, like there has to be some sort of moral law, that, some sort of overarching law that helps inform what good laws are. Yeah. Yeah. When we're told, when we're forced to do things against Scripture. Yeah, and so you have, yeah, and so you have kind of a, yeah. Yeah, not, not all rebellion ends up in armed rebellion, right? Different kinds of rebellions, yeah. That's, a, that's, an even, that's, a, that's an armed rebellion. It's a different kind of arming, right? I mean, that's a, sort, of the, sort of the spirit armed. But yeah, I mean, yeah, so you can, you can do those things. And I think actually in most places we're called to do that. So that is, that is a rebellion. But it's a different kind of rebellion. So not everything has to end in an armed rebellion. But it's, you can rebel in, in godly ways against unjust laws. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think the command here is like to just go out and enforce laws in that way. Like, like let's, let's go out and we're not getting our way. This is God's law. Shouldn't it be the law of the land? Well, let's go and, and wipe out the government until we can get. I don't think that's what we're called to do. We're called to, to build good societies following the laws of the land and change laws and build structures in, in a way that is glorifying to God. That's a rebellion against unjust laws, but it's not, 
murdering people to institute laws. It's not a coup. Right. Right. Well, I mean, and listen, when when you're when you're offering up a contrary set of values and and ideas, it's going to be viewed as a threat to whatever government's in power. Right? I mean, you're offering up an opposing view and so you're viewed as as some sort of person who's undermining government. And we've seen that throughout church history. And we see it in Scripture, right? That, to, to use your exact thing, the, the people of Christ were viewed as, as undermining the Roman government. And we've seen that from Christians throughout history, that they've been accused of undermining the government, undermining the king. And so that we have to be... So, so our very existence, in some sense, is, is that, right? If we're going to live out the values of the kingdom, the commands of God... We are in our very existence is a threat in some way to earthly powers. And so that doesn't mean we need to then go, oh, if we're going to be a threat, let's be a, a serious threat. And let's like, let's go like build up a, an armory in Montana. And it doesn't, doesn't mean that's what we do. But it means that we recognize that when, when we oppose the values of what's going on, like, I mean, I mean, it's pretty obvious that one of the, the clear violations of the Noahic command is that we have legalized abortion. That's a very clear implication of this, is that the, the call is to be fruitful and multiply and to not kill. Now you combine both of those things together, you have abortion. Right? Let's, not be, let's kill in our womb. Let's, 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 let's use murder to stop from being fruitful and multiply. Right? Now... What is, how do you oppose that? And that's where, I mean, we're, there's, we have, us opposing it at all, you get attacks from the outside of going, I mean, the, a common sense argument of, hey, we shouldn't do this, is met with, you hate women, you hate, well, and it's just, right, it's just on down the line. So just the standing on a, on a basic moral platform puts you at odds with society. And the irony of it is, this is the irony of it is, Sinful men have so twisted things that they don't see that those, such a thing is undermining society. This is, the found, the, this is the foundation for society building. If you're going to do things, you need to multiply greatly, and you need to build a just society with laws. Primarily, the, the most obvious of laws is you can't murder. Now, there's other laws that I think flow from that, but starting out, if you get murder wrong, like... <laughs> Pretty sure you're okay with theft, right? Like so, if you if you get this one wrong, this is the, this is the biggest one. If you get this one wrong, then all the other stuff isn't going to fall. Is not going to work. If you get this right, there's a good chance you're going to go. Okay, well, what else does that does that entail? What other kind of structure should be legalized? Structure should be in place. And so, I think that all flows from the Noahic covenant. So I got to press on. If we have more questions, we talk about it at the end. But we got to press on because I don't want to spend. I only, I only want to spend this week on the Noahic covenant. Um, all right, so Noahic Covenant governs the common kingdom of mankind, and as a society, we're called to promote, preserve, protect life of individuals, life of the family. Those are the basic commitments. As a result, we punish the wicked, we put to death murderers, and we must seek with God's help to exemplify and manifest real, loving, thriving families. Right? In that sense, we are a model for the rest of the world. Our homes ought to model what it looks like to be thriving families. Now, in this covenant, that's the expectations that God puts on man. This is what you will do. Now, what's n n interesting here is there is no stipulations for what happens if you don't do it. The implications are clear, though. Your societies will be garbage. And then we read world history, <laughs> right? And you go, oh, why did this society fall apart? As great as it looked, why did it fall apart? Usually because of this, right? Why are societies falling apart today? I think because of this. Poor, a misunderstanding of the importance of life and justice, but also um, if, you're, if your uh, um, reproduction rate is 1.1, look, looking at you, France and Italy, Guess what? How many people does it take? Yeah, China. How many, how many people does it take to get to the to the next generation? 
Like, two, well, it takes two, two people to have one baby. That's the 1.1. For every couple, the reproduction rate is 1.1. That doesn't mean they're having two kids per family. It means the, the reproduction rate, the, the reproduction rate is below, it's half of, of sustainability. So you need 2.1 to sustain society. 1.1 is half of that, right? Sorry, convoluted way to get back to what I was trying to say. 2.1 is just to keep it level. 1.1, half of that. So societies are, are going to crumble in that sense. All right. So the command is clear, but the stipulations are, are not as obvious. Right? The, the, there is the consequences, the, the, the punishment for it is not overt like it is in other covenants. It's more implied. So that's what man is required to do. You obey these commands. This is what's going to happen. And if you do this, it's, it's going well for you. If you don't do this, then the implication is it's going to go very poorly for you. What are God's commitments in this covenant? That's where you look at verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and within your offspring after you, excuse me, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again, never again uh, shall there be a flood. Right? That never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. By the way, you understand bow. What, what kind of bow are we talking about? We understand it's a rainbow. But what's the picture of a rainbow? A bow and arrow. Not like a tie it up with a nice little bow. Right? That's, I'm setting my bow. Right? The weapon of judgment of sorts. I'm setting it in the sky. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the and the earth. Verse 14. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Also, when we say remember, what do we mean here? Is God like, for, is God forgetting his covenant? Is that what he's saying? It's, it's a reminder, not just to God, it's God basically reestablishing, kind of reinvigorating the covenant with the people. It's a reminder to us, of God's promise. And it's also God reestablishing, going, I, I will, I see that, and I also know I'm, I'm affirming the covenant that I've made. I'm reaffirming it with you. So I will remember my covenant is between me and you and every living creature of the flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And so to be clear, who is the covenant for? All flesh that is on the earth. All creatures that are on the earth. So the Noah, Noahic covenant expands from Noah to his family, to all mankind, to all the earth, to all flesh. And so God promises that a great deep will never overtake the world again. Mankind will never be wiped out by flood ever again. And as a visible picture, as a sign of that covenant, God designates the rainbow to be a visible promise of that reality. And so, what is the promise? The, that under God's provision, earth will go on. Seasons will come and seasons will go and rains will come and rains will go and people will come and people will go and the earth will move on in the, in the manner with which God has set it up, it will carry out its purpose and it will keep on going. God will not destroy it again by flood. And so this is a covenant with obligations. But its promised blessings won't ever be removed. God will not flood the earth again and the rainbow is God's visible promise to the world. God promises to preserve creation. Not eternally in this covenant, Right? But never again will flood destroy earth. And this promise is not even predicated on what we do. Which is good, right? How many rainbows would have ever been seen if it was predicated on man keeping up his end of the bargain? Zero. 
So the reason and purpose for this promise of preservation is that it creates the platform. This is what I was saying before. This, it creates kind of the, the substructure, the, the foundation on which God's plan of salvation will be carried out. God promising not to wipe out the earth becomes the, the, look, the place where we see all these covenants. We see the covenant of redemption play itself out through the, the, this promise made here, through the covenant with Abraham and Moses and David, all the way through the coming of Christ. It's the, it becomes the, the, the stage, the theater on which God carries out salvation. And that, sta- and that stage is stable because of the Noahic covenant. That's the, the promise of this. And therefore the people of God can know at all times, whether before or after the advent of the promised seed, that God will not destroy the earth until he has fulfilled every single promise to his people. All right. So how does the Noahic covenant fit in there? It's a universal covenant and then it's the groundwork, the, 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 the ground level the foundation on which all the other covenants play themselves out. All the other covenants play themselves out within the covenant, within the kingdom of creation. Right, everything else is a subset of that. that. Make sense? Okay. So, how do we describe this kingdom? We got a, a few minutes left to talk about this. How do we describe this kingdom? The kingdom of creation is a common kingdom, but it's cursed. It's a, it's a kingdom of grace. Right? Under Adam, Adam had a commission to extend uh, Eden to the world, to make the world a temple. Adam was the federal head of all mankind, and in Adam, Adam's false, we all sinned. All of creation is governed by the covenant of works. And this was proven by the fact that when Adam broke that covenant, all creation was cursed. Mankind, the ground, all things. And God established that kingdom of creation by the covenant of works. In Noah's case, the flood narrative and the commission given to Noah present kind of a new creation and a new commission. It's not repeating what we saw there, but it is kind of echoing what we saw in Adam. The kingdom of creation is governed by two covenants. The covenant of, work, curse, covenant of works curses mankind, and the Noahic covenant kind of stabilizes the cursed world so that redemptive history can play itself out. So if you're looking to figure out how these all fit together, that's how it fits together. The covenant of works, all mankind is cursed. In the covenant with Noah, the world is kind of stabilized by God. Common grace is given so that all the rest can play itself out. Any questions on that? What is life like in that kingdom? Read Ecclesiastes. (laughs) All right, I mean, that's... You go, this, it, see, it feels unstable. It says it's stable because God has made it stable. It seems unstable because mankind is still sinful. And so the promise of redemption doesn't come through the Noahic covenant. It comes through the new covenant. It comes through the covenant of grace. So any other questions? Any questions? All right. If you want to talk, I'll be up here. I'll end now. I don't get any lectures about going too long. Uh, if you want to talk, have any questions you want to come, I'll be, want to ask, I'll come up, you can come up here and I'll stay here and you can ask those questions. Let me pray. Uh, Father God, thank you for your work in stabilizing our society. Lord, we pray for change in our society. Lord, we pray that we pray, we pray that our society would, um, would live by the commands you give of the Noahic covenant, that we would be uh, committed to justice um, that we'd be committed to uh, the consequences of murder, um, that a life is demanded for a life. Lord, we, we pray that we would be a society that understands the, the benefit of being fruitful and multiplying. Uh, and so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be good citizens in this kingdom, good citizens in this society, that we would, uh, that we would push forth as Christians the truth of the gospel. Um, first and foremost, to see the kingdom of God expand, but also for the good of our neighbor in seeing uh, a society that is a, a better reflection of what you have called societies to be. And so, Lord, we ask your help in doing that. Um, let us not lose sight of our primary task of sharing the gospel for the salvation of sinners, but neither should we make that our whole task. Help us to, to see also that you've called us to be good, 
good workers and good citizens and good neighbors. And we, call, we, we pray that you would help us to do all those things. In the name of Christ, amen.